It's what the F happened. A week in review where we rant and rave all about the things going on in the stock market and all the unbelievable craziness that's happening. Steven and I, we're going to talk about when does the housing boom end? Why is real estate so crazy? Does it mimic what happened in 2006 through 2008? Is the same thing going to happen? And we're also going to talk about one of the most important things, and that is how similar the market conditions are today to what they were in 1929. So folks, get ready. This is going to be an unbelievable show. And every single week, we do the same thing where we dissect the week in review and we talk about what the F happened. We'll see you in So how much more money can they print? How much more can they print? Well, just recently, the Senate Dems announced another $3.5 trillion budget. I don't know if you guys saw this, Stephen. I don't know if you saw this, but a $3.5 trillion budget agreement to be spent over the coming decade. decade. More printing. Is this is this the money that they're going to use to fund the you know, hiring of about 80,000 IRS agents? I mean, they got to pay for this shit somehow, man. What do you think, Stephen? I think that we've printed over 40% of the total money supply in the history of the world in the last 12 months or so. And I think that the Fed is just hammering, hammering, hammering. Everything's great. And everyone's still buying. And I don't think it's going to end well. Wait, wait, wait. Can you just, just, let's take a step back, Stephen. You talk really fast. Did you just say they printed 40% of the current money supply? Of the total money supply ever in the history of the world has been printed in the last 12 months or so. Dude, man, it's time to get the boxing gloves out and start pounding on this thing because, dude, like, when does it stop? Well, I, I can tell you right now. I mean, one of the things we do here is I study economic reports. I study a whole bunch of economists and a lot of the economists, not the ones that I see on TikTok that say buy term, invest the difference. I don't follow them, but I'm talking about real economists that really study this. They went to school for this and, and not just any economist. I'm talking world renowned economists and I, and I take a little bit from each of them and I kind of, I, I try to find similar patterns and those patterns all come down to some of the same things. And we're going to get into those same things, but you know what, let's get into housing, you know, right here in the news, Apple and Goldman Sachs plan to buy a, uh, they plan to um, do a buy now pay later service to rival a firm. And I have something here. I'll pop it up on the screen. But, you know, like, think about this. Buy now, pay later. We've seen that in car companies, you know, where you can buy the car and you buy it and you pay later and they rob you blind. Well, now Apple and Goldman are going to do the same thing. And they're not just a small company. That's a large investment bank. And that's probably the largest company in this country. Let me put it up on the screen here for you, Stephen, because this is this is definitely one worth talking about. So here we go. We got it up on the screen, folks. So Apple and Goldman plan buy now, pay later service to rival a firm. So what does this mean? Does this mean there's going to be more credit going on? You know, they're going to they're going to make credit even easier, which, you know, isn't that all we seem to see today? Printing money equals easy credit because the banks just have too much freaking money and they need to do something with it. So, oh, look at that. There's your pop up. Let's get rid of that pop up. We don't want to claim the offer today. And look at, they won't even let me get rid of that. They're like, no, you have to claim the offer. Otherwise you can't read the article from Bloomberg. Is this even going to come up or are they just waiting? No, look at that. How about that folks? Like literally I can't pull up the screen. Nope. Nope. It took me somewhere else. All right. So screw that. Bloomberg kiss my ass and kiss Steven's ass on the way out the door too. But anyway, no, this doesn't make any sense. More debt, no interest payments. It sounds familiar to the housing crisis. Let's take a trip back in time, folks. How many of you are old enough to remember 2006, 2007, and 2008? Stephen, you remember that? Oh, yeah. When those periods of time happened, I was a financial advisor, and I was at the, one of the peaks of my career, and I remember like real estate was going nuts. You know, you, you heard about people all over the place being able to kind of their equity and they were buying multiple houses. There was no one, I mean, no one out there that couldn't get credit to buy a house. And 
And when they were doing this, it was it was driving this massive bubble, this massive bubble, which, as we all know, turned into what we would call the Great Recession of 2008. And I lived through the Great Recession. All of you did or your parents did or your grandparents did. And it sucked. I almost went bankrupt. I almost lost everything. You know, the, the Wall Street firms like Goldman were putting together all these fancy, dancy, freaking packaged investments and selling them off to anybody that would take them. So it was the last person holding those GMOs and CMOs got stuck with the bag. So now what are they doing? They're creating more debt. You know, into banks, debt's a good thing. Think about this. To a bank, debt, the mortgage that you have, your car um, loan, your personal loan, all of these things, my phone is just not cooperating. All of these things, these debts are assets to a bank. So they want more of them. And the Fed just keeps giving the banks more and more money and the investment firms and Wall Street more and more money. So they're just creating more and more debt. But then when that debt gets created, they got to sell it off because why make money long haul? Why, why, you know, create wealth that takes time like debt? You know, how, how much time does it take a bank to monetize a mortgage? The answer is they don't know because it's too long. So they package that mortgage up along with the lawnmower loan, along with the loan for the car and everything else. And they sell it off in the secondary and tertiary markets. So who's tertiary? You are, folks. They package them up into those beautiful mutual funds that you all own inside your 401ks. Oh, yeah. And you know what happened in 08? Those blew the market up. Oh, but the Fed and the government fixed that, didn't they? Obviously not. You think that GMOs and CMOs are gone? You think that banks are actually safer drivers now than they were in 2008? Folks, you are, if, if that's what you think, you are living in a fantasy land. Turn on, uh, what, what's a great fantasy movie that you've watched, Stephen? <laughs> I, that's a good question, actually. A great fantasy movie. That's what's going on right now. I think the Matrix could be it, Chris. Well, the Matrix could be that. I mean, um, uh, there's one I'm thinking of. It's uh, anyway, anyway well, that's what's going on out there. They're creating the same bullshit they did back in 2006, 2007, 2008, packaging it in a different little thing with a different colored bow tie and selling it back to you in your 401k, in your Robin Hood account, in your brokerage accounts. Folks, what does all this mean? Well, if you really look at some of the economists like this one here, let me read something, Stephen. The second housing boom is totally a totally different animal. He's referring to 2008's housing bubble, and he's referring to today's housing bubble. Not only did housing long ago peak for the latest or the largest generation history, but the central banks pulled out all the stops to push interest rates to near negative. So why is this real estate bubble or why are your prices of your house skyrocketing? Low interest rates are one thing. Demand is another thing. Everybody wants to get a bigger house, move into something else because you got the FOMO, the fear of missing out. You're going to miss those low interest rates. Hurry up, sell your house and move into the way overpriced one. Anyway, I'm getting way ahead of myself. But he says that everyday home prices. So the, the median everyday home price, follow this, is a whopping $394,000. That's across the country. Okay, across the nation, 394000 is the everyday home price. But now you might be like, okay, yeah, Chris, what, what good does that do me? Hear me out. That was 199000 in the top of the last bubble. So think about that. We're at 394000 is the median home price. And back in 2008, at the top, before it all crashed, it was 199000 Even adjusted for inflation, Okay, and higher incomes like we have today, that means that house prices are 5% higher than they were back then. Now, most of you might actually think about that and be like, oh, well, that doesn't look too bad until you actually look at a chart like this. Okay, so any of you looking, that's the chart. Check this thing out. Does that look normal? Like, should the pricing go straight up? Is that normal? Nope, that's not normal. This housing clap, this is from The Economist. Now, hear, hear this this housing collapse obviously will be greater than the last one, which took average prices down 30%. And that was, that was higher than the Great Depression, folks. The Great Depression, housing prices only dropped 26%. I know, but you might say, oh, it was different back then. But I always hear, oh, it was different back then. Well, maybe a little bit. But he is predicting a downturn that will end up being a short depression in 2023 and that housing prices will fall more like 50% this time. 
and will never recover from present day highs. You don't like the sound of this? Good. Keep living in your fantasy bubble. Keep living in the inception world, the matrix world, because you can live any way you want. You can just go about your life until it's all over and you get punched right in the face. Because, you know, what did Mike Tyson say, Stephen? Didn't Mike Tyson say something about getting punched in the face? <laughs> yeah, it's all good until you get punched in the face. Yeah, every, everything's all good until you get punched. <laughs> pretty good statement from a really smart guy like Mike Tyson. And, and I, I do hear that a lot, though, Chris. You know, that it's different time. Housing market is different this time. History always repeats. I don't care what the driving factor is. Maybe they're giving away a lot more free loans back then, but guess what they're doing now? They're giving away the lowest interest rate loans in the history of the country. I mean, I just read an article this morning, weekly mortgage refinances spike 20% after interest rates drop again to February low. I mean, they came down to 3.09. So the Fed is just controlling it, just dropping rates. They're forcing people to push these applications through. Overall applications are down though from last year. So it's, it's all the signs are there. I don't care what the underlying circumstances are and driving forces are. They're driving it all the same and it's not going to end well. Well, Lynn coming in from Facebook said, so should I sell now and buy in a few years? Well, if you listen to this economist, that's exactly what he says right here in bold. It's crazy, Lynn. Here's what he says. Sell now or be stuck with that home forever and hunker down for the crash in the financial crisis of our lifetime. Now, this economist is a bit, you know, drastic and a bit, you know, kind of just out there, but it's, it's still an economist, not just an economist, a world renowned economist. So he is saying sell now. But you know what? So is Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett says what? Buy low, sell high and don't lose money. Like I'm selling off most of my rental portfolio. We went from 91 rentals down to under 20 and one was supposed to close this week and it didn't because the banks are assholes. But anyway, we won't go there. So. What should you do? Well, I don't know. It's tough. You know, when you're talking about a house, you're talking about where family lives. You're talking about the place you grew up in. You're talking about your home. It's not always looked at as an investment. Your home is where you live. So if you sell it, where else are you going to go? Stephen, we have this call all the time with our, with our clients. You know, they're saying, well, should I sell my house? And my question is always, okay, if you sell your house, even though you sell it for top of the market, where are you going to go? Oh, well, I'd have to buy another house. Okay, so you're going to sell high and you're going to buy high. That makes no bloody freaking sense. You'd be better off just keep it, keeping your house, making some biweekly payments toward that mortgage or using you know something like the infinite banking concept to pay that mortgage down. But anyway, not going well, there. And Chris, if, if your mortgage is down here right now and all of a sudden your house value spiked to the highest levels in history and you're expecting that to come down and you don't want to move because you love your house or, you know, like you said, where are you going to go if you do sell? Why not take advantage of that spread? Take advantage of that equity. Get a HELOC. Get that money to work. Maybe dump it into a policy first, but get that money to work. Create profit for yourself. Cycle that back into your own private bank or into your savings or wherever you put money or reinvest it. Keep the money growing while you can. Because once it comes down, those HELOCs are going to go away. That equity is going to go away. You're not going to have that free, lazy money to put to work anymore. So take advantage of it while you can. And if this doesn't happen until 2023, you have two years of hundred, two hundred thousand dollars of equity. How much equity do you have in your home? Do that at ten to twelve percent a year with a simple passive investment loan into something affordable housing or quick flips or something like that, and boom, you're all of a sudden generating, I don't know, ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars a year for yourself. Do that. Dude, that's a great idea. And literally, like you, you took the idea I was coming up with right out of my mouth. But this is what we always talk about. You know, what do the wealthy do different than we do? They move money. They know how to move their money like the banks do. But what do we do? We get excited because we have equity in our house. We get excited because on a piece of paper, we're looking at, holy cow, look at my 401k. It's up 30% until you get punched in the face and your 401k is down 30%. You see, the thing is, is you're only up until you lose it all. And the only way to, to basically play the game and make sure that you don't lose it all is to follow some simple rules. If you have a house that has equity, you should tap into that equity, but only if you know where to put that money. So if you have a home equity line of credit, let's say you bought your house at 100 and it's worth 200, you got 100,000 in equity. You could probably access 80% of that or $80,000. Now, what would you do with $80,000? Let's just do a quick little lesson. If you had $80,000 available in the rafters of your house, what would you do with that? 
you know, the, the, I don't want to be mean here, but you know, the not so smart people would be like, Oh honey, let's put a new kitchen in. Let's put a new bathroom in. Oh, I've been wanting that man cave. No, that new Corvette just came out wrong, wrong and wrong. What you should do is look at where all your money goes every single month. Do a budget income liabilities. Let's look at what the liabilities are. Oh, we have a credit cards. We have credit card, credit card, line of credit, line of credit, personal loan, car loan. Great. Let's put them in order from lowest to highest, lowest debt, like lowest balance to highest. And then let's start knocking those out. Let's take that 80 grand that we got that was sitting in the rafters of our house and let's pay off the credit cards one after the other. Okay. But then let's not stop there. Let's take this same dollar amount you used to give to Visa, Discover, Amazon, all those credit cards, and take that same amount once you pay those cards off and pay that money back to your home equity line of credit. Take that money and put that money in your privatized bank. Take that money and recapture and recycle it and just go right down the line. Now what you've done, folks, is you have begun the process of building tremendous amounts of wealth and you didn't have to work any harder. You didn't take on any risk and you didn't lose control of your money. All you freaking did. I mean, what the app, folks, you're watching what the app and I can't say the app word. So I wanted to, but what the app, that's where your wealth goes. You give it all away to somebody else. Take that shit back. And it's very easy to do. Just told you how to do it. And you don't like that. Go to my website and watch a video on how to do it. So simple. That's what you need to be doing. You need to be learning how to build wealth in the simplest, easiest way is take your lazy money, put it to work, and then recycle and recapture the money you're giving away. Voila. How much do you give away each month? What's your car payment? How much you give into those credit card companies? How much you give into those personal loans? Oh, I'm sure you got one of those Apple phone loans or Samsung loans. Where is all your money going every month? Well, what if we didn't owe all those people money? What if we use the lazy money sitting in the rafters or that lazy money sitting in that stupid 401k that you should sell high and you move that money over to pay off all these debts? And then you took those liabilities and you convert them to an asset by simply paying yourself back the same amount you were paying them. Like, how freaking easy is that? Yes, folks, that's the secret. But Stephen, let's go to round two here. We got something else we got to really talk about. And this yeah. woke me up this morning right here. Okay, so folks, I don't know if you guys can see this, but I really want to first help you understand something. Number one, I'm a nerd. I'm a numbers nerd and I'm a history nerd. And, and I don't like to openly say that because I kind of sometimes look like, you know, I don't have the glasses, the big, you know, Pepsi glasses, but I am absolutely a nerd when it comes to studying history because I am a firm believer, just like every economist I've ever seen, that history repeats itself. When? That's the magic question, but history will repeat itself. So if we look at the patterns of history and we then try to figure out how do they lay up next to what's going on today? Well, you know what? Somebody else did the work for me. Check this chart out, Stephen. This is wild. Look, this is 1929 versus today, okay? Right here, this is 1929, the orange. I just want you guys to look at it. And clearly, I just want everybody to realize that right there, that's the Great Depression. This right here, is 1929, but let's focus just specifically on one part of this, okay? So we all know what happened in the, the Great Depression. It sucked, you know, it was a terrible period of time, one of the worst crashes of the market ever and the economy, and it, and it lasted for a very long time. But I really want you to look at this, and then I want you to look at where we're at today. Now, this chart is only up through May. Now, I know I'm behind by two months, okay, because now we're in July. But this is as of May. So just look at 1929 versus today. This is today. X marks the spot right here. Okay. So this is what the market has looked like since July all the way through May. Okay. That's today. This was the Great Depression. Hmm. How many of you think that kind of looks the same? Does that look the same? TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Does that not look like the same damn period of time? Like, come on, am I am I making this shit up? No. And then I want you to really focus on this period, okay? Forget all the rest of it. That's not important. I want you to look at this right here, okay? This is 1929, right here. Now, many people think that the Great Depression happened all at once in 1929, but it didn't. The Great Depression, just like COVID last year, took an initial crash. And then, unlike today where the Fed jumped in and stimulated it, back then it was the big banks. It was the guys with all the money. They jumped in and plowed money in. They backed all the margin accounts and they said, we're going to put $100 million toward this credit. 
they were stimulating the market because there was a lot of people, big bankers that thought the markets were going to keep going up. They were trying to profit up. They literally had an ego the size of Texas that said, we can keep this market where it's at. Clearly, history will prove that they couldn't. But that's what they did. They propped the market up. And this is what you got. Now, this doesn't look like a long period of time right here. Okay, I want you to look at that. It doesn't look like it was long, but it was, it was actually quite a bit of time from there to there. They would call that the V. Very similar to last year in COVID, from there to there. And it just, during that period of time, when the market bouncing came back, there was, it was the summer season, people were out there, they're partying, everybody had money, everybody's making money in the stock market. If I'm not mistaken, it grew almost 50% in that short little period. Okay, whoa, let's time out for a second, Stephen. How much has the stock market grown since last year when the whole world shut down due to COVID? Is it 50%? Is it 30? Does anyone know? It's a lot. That's the only thing. Just like 1929, but it almost looks identical. Look at this. This isn't superimposed right there and right there. But then what happened after that? After the summer season, after everybody went to their vacation homes and everybody was rallying and making a ton of money? That's right, folks. It crashed. It completely crashed and created what we now know and remember as the 1929 through 1932 Great Depression. But it didn't end in 1932. Okay, I want to be clear. It continued to stim like kind of go sideways for almost 30 years. So what's going to happen now? So are we coming up to what would be the next Great Depression? I don't know, folks really up to a lot of things. Is the government going to continue to keep stimulating the markets? There's just so much crap going on. But let's go to the final thing. I'm going to share my screen here. And we do this every single week. The greed index. Folks, you've all heard this before. When others are greedy, be fearful. And when others are fearful, be greedy. So we look at this index. Index tracks this. And it says, where are we on the fear and greed? So we are at a 39. We're moving more toward the fear. Does that mean that stock prices are coming down? Not really. A little bit yesterday. But if we get too far into that fear, the fear will drive reaction, which will drive people to sell out of those stocks. Because remember, people that buy high, what do they do? They buy high and they sell low. And then the smart ones do what? Buy low and sell high. So we look at this fear and greed index. So the previous close was fear at 39. One week ago, the fear was at 41. So we're slipping and going more. Well, over here's my opinion. Here's my new opinion on this index, Chris. I just learned it's from CNN and just like all the other news from CNN is garbage in my opinion. So I'm no longer going to be talking about the fear and greed index. And that's my statement for July 14th, 2021. All right. I love it. You know, whether it's the fear and greed index whether it's comparing 1926 to 1929, right up to today's patterns and what's going on in the stock market. So folks, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode and this week's version of What the F Happened. Join us next week, same time, same place. All right, if you like that video, make sure you check out this video right now. And also don't forget, subscribe to my channel and don't ever forget to smash that alert button. We'll see you on the next one.